Uh, good evening, everyone. Or good afternoon. It's really dark out. So it's good evening. Um, so welcome. My name is uh, Petrus Van Bakkes. I'm the director of the Institute of Eastern Mediterranean Studies here at Emmanuel College. And it's uh, giving me a great pleasure to uh, welcome you all for a variety of reasons, not least of which that it's our first post pandemic event here at the old Fenway room that you know, we started out um, in 2018. And here we are back finishing or completing our third year uh, of existence. And we're coming back with a, a great, great panel and a great, great uh, uh, subject uh, looking at uh, Turkey and uh, its relationship, its transatlantic relationship uh, on a, you know, on a, on a great uh, new book that has come out in 2019, a uh, young scholar who's at the Weatherhead Center. And I met her uh, recently and read the book and it's, I'm excited uh, to hear more about um, uh, the book and also have two great friends uh, sort of like to discuss this and then have a wider discussion with all of you. Um, just a few words about the Eastern Mediterranean and the Institute. Uh, this is, uh, we're coming up to our 10th anniversary as an idea that has been uh, implemented. It started out as an idea uh, a decade ago as uh, Greece and, and the Southern European states were going through an economic crisis and the North African states were going through a political crisis. Uh, it seemed like a, a great place to really bring students and turn the Eastern Mediterranean into a a classroom of sorts. Uh, it was a crazy idea, October of 2011. Uh, we had a sort of new uh, vice president of academic affairs here at Emmanuel College. And you know, I, I know my politics a little bit. So you, you strike when people are young and new in a position because you can get all kinds of things done. Uh, and uh, that worked. Uh, we got this program through and we brought students to the Eastern Mediterranean in the summer of 2012. And since then, we have gone back and done programs every summer in the Eastern Mediterranean the last couple of years through Zoom, but we continued on and we have really gotten a lot of momentum and a lot of support. And there's a lot of support here in this room. You know, the, the Tower family has been very uh, instrumental in, in helping all along, you know, Mary Tower went to the program in 2015. And so this has been like this grassroots effort. Um, Mr. Dennis was here, has been a great supporter. And, you know, we had the uh, seminars, the virtual seminars the last couple of years, the George and Dennis um, seminar on the Eastern Mediterranean. Last June, January, we had a seminar that uh, had uh, 45 students participating from the region. And we brought together 30 um, scholars, policymakers, and practitioners from the region for a one week seminar. Um, since then, we've brought 165 students to the Eastern Mediterranean and given out more than $70,000 in scholarship money since 2005. So, this has been a, a great grassroots effort, and I'm not doing anything without the support of. A lot of students uh, who are in this room, uh, Natalie Gavorgan, who's going to lead the discussion today, Leila Grage, who has come on this year, Maria Mujahid, who is here, uh, Anthony and Sabrine, who are, you know, newly arrivals and hopefully get rope in Nick and Paul, who I see in the audience, and Jake and Peter and Melissa and everybody else. And so I'm just saying all this to say that, you know, this is, this is really great. Uh, that uh, we brought everybody together. And our mission is to bring awareness to a region that has been in sort of like, you know, this, this in the back of, of people's minds as a travel area. And we like to say that this is a crossroads of civilizations and trade and economics and politics and history and language and everything that, that happens crosses over the Eastern Mediterranean. So uh, it's great to see all of you. Um, you're not going to hear from me. That's why I guess I'm holding the, the floor of this room right now. But if you, uh, there's a, we've been doing a great presentation and celebrating our third anniversary at our headquarters up at the Notre Dame campus, which is a mile away from here on Saturday evening. And I welcome all of you back there. I'm gonna take my seat and listen to this great discussion. 
and I yield the floor to um, Ms. Natalie Cavorn, who's our, she's finishing up this year, so she's on a great day for us. Hi everyone, thank you Dr. Vambakis. I'd like to thank everyone for being here and a special thank you to our guest speakers uh, for being here today with us. At this time, I'd like to do the introductions of our speakers. So our first speaker is Dr. Oscancha. Dr. Oscancha is the Endowed Chair of International Studies and Professor of Political Science at Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania. She is also a visiting scholar at the Waterhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University. Her research interests include Turkish foreign policy, transatlantic security, European Union, Southeast Europe, and peace operations. She is the author of the new book, Turkey West Relations, The Politics of Intra-Alliance Oppositions, published by Cambridge University Press in November of 2019. Our second speaker is Ambassador Vesko Garcevich. Mr. Garcevich is a professor of practice of international relations at Boston University. He served as the ambassador of Montenegro in Brussels and Vienna. He was a Montenegrin ambassador to Austria, Belgium, Luxembourg, and the Netherlands. During his diplomatic career, he held important positions at the challenging political <coughs> time of the dissolution of the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia and the democratic transition of Montenegro. After Montenegro regained independence in 2006, he served as the first Montenegrin ambassador to Austria. He has outstanding knowledge of multilateral issues, especially in the field of European security. And our third speaker today is Mr. Ho Yi. Mr. Yi was a career foreign service officer at the US Department of State from 1988 to 2019. His diplomatic assignments include Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, Deputy Chief of Mission at the US Embassy in Zagreb, Croatia, Director of Office of Provincial Reconstruction in Kabul, Afghanistan, Council General in Thessaloniki, Greece, and in Padagorica, Montenegro, and Director for European Affairs at the National Security Council. He also served at the NATO headquarters and as the US embassies in Paris, France, and Port-au-Prince, Haiti. He was a Dean Rusk Fellow and visiting lecturer at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service and a senior fellow at the US Institute of Peace. Since, since leaving government, he has worked in the um, energy sector as a consultant and senior vice president in global, global affairs and counselor global PLC. And at this time, I'd like to yield the floor to our speakers with Dr. Oskancha going first and then followed by Ambassador Garcevich and Mr. Yi. And after we will open the floor to our audience for the Q&A portion of the event. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, it is not every day that I am described as a young scholar, so I will thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. It's a great honor to be in front of this wonderful audience here discussing a very important topic in international affairs, Turkey and its relations with the West. As we all know, uh, not a day passes uh, when a headline or uh, news, uh, you know, uh, broadcasters uh, talk about and question the reliability of Turkey as a Western ally. And I would like to start my talk uh, by mentioning that uh, this has not been the case typically or traditionally. So let me take us all the way back to the beginning of this relationship. So. Uh, when um, uh, Turkey uh, was, um, uh, uh, back when uh, Turkey was uh, considered to be a reliable actor, reliable partner of the West uh, during the Cold War, uh, it has uh, been so willing to take part in the NATO uh, alliance that it sacrificed uh, a lot of its, uh, uh, you know, lives in order to become, during the Korean War, to become a member of NATO, and it did in 1952, three years after the alliance has been formed. And on top of this, Turkey has been a member of Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe since 1973. Turkey has initiated this association agreement with, 19, uh, with the European Economic Community at the time uh, in 1959 and signed the association agreement in 1963 with the EEC at the time, the grandfather of the European Union, if you will. And uh, ever since then, um, 
Turkey has been very eager to join the European Union and in 1999 it has been made an official candidate country to the European Union at the Helsinki summit and uh, in 2004 uh, actually in uh, in the beginning of 2005 the accession negotiations has been uh, initiated with Turkey in order to um, uh, negotiate the uh, chapters of accession, uh, uh, its uh, potential accession into the European Union. So since then, uh, there has only been one chapter that has been successfully and provisionally uh, completed, uh, that is the research chapter. And uh, a number of chapters have been vetoed by the European Union member states, and a number of them have been vetoed by uh, the European uh, Council itself. Um, and um, due to primarily Turkey's unwillingness to implement uh, uh, the Ankara Protocol um, uh, with the European Union uh, and refusing to open up its ports and airports to the Republic of Cyprus due to the fact that Turkey does not recognize the Republic of Cyprus. So that is where the EU negotiations are. Uh, in fact, uh, since then there have been multiple crises <laughs> Um, and um, so what we have seen right now is the freezing of EU accession negotiations uh, by the European Union uh, as a result of uh, its criticism of the Turkish, um, uh, you know, weaknesses uh, in the Turkish system, political system. Um, and uh, mainly the checks and balances, uh, the weaknesses of the checks and balances uh, upon uh, the switch into the new presidential system in Turkey. Uh, so we are seeing um, um, and uh, the referendum for which has been held uh, during the state of emergency in Turkey uh, in um, in the aftermath of the failed coup attempt uh, in Turkey in July 2016. Um, so, uh, on the other <laughs> front of the relations in terms of Turkey's relations with the West, uh, we see Turkey's relations with the United States and NATO. And uh, they are also not looking so promising uh, in the sense that um, Turkey used to be referred to as a reliable partner, reliable ally uh, since 1952. Uh, during the Cold War, it has been a, a staunch uh, ally um, and um, it really uh, helped the United States and its allies in uh, countering the influence of the Soviet Union and uh, in the book uh, I make a reference um, to, uh, to uh, why and how uh, Turkish foreign policy has changed so much vis-a-vis -vis the West, West meaning the European Union, NATO and the United States. Uh, so what I do is, if I were to uh, walk you through my journey here, uh, the idea of the book started with an LSE, London School of Economics Fellowship, that I had in 2013. And um, I conducted a number of uh, field uh, research uh, trips, field trips, um, and in a variety of countries, uh, conducting uh, elite interviews, semi-structured elite interviews uh, with um, over 200 elites, uh, NGO officials, IGO officials like uh, EU and NATO and United Nations, uh, with uh, policymakers from Turkey, UK, United States, uh, various different uh, countries in the Balkans, uh, Germany, United States, uh, and uh, uh, the Republic of Cyprus as well. And uh, at the same time, uh, I have also uh, engaged in a process tracing uh, type of uh, uh, work uh, with triangulation of the um, uh, process, uh, making sure that the information that I'm receiving from the elites really are consistent with the track record of the facts and the timeline of the facts that took place. So. Uh, what I did was I uh, created a framework, framework called intra-alliance opposition. And um, basically in that framework, uh, I used the tools of statecraft that are identified by the soft balancing literature, uh, meaning soft balancing, meaning balancing between allies, balancing between friends, if you will. Uh, so through the use of some economic uh, pressures, 
uh, economic tools of statecraft, uh, some institutional balancing, and um, you know mainly the use of diplomatic means in terms of opposing your uh, counterpart allies. And that soft balancing uh, literature really provided me with a wonderful wealth of tools of statecraft that are identified, which I in turn uh, categorized them into three different uh, processes of intra-alliance opposition. Those three different processes of intra-alliance opposition are a boundary testing, boundary challenging and boundary breaking. So boundary testing, boundary challenging and boundary breaking. And what do I mean by these different processes? Um, boundary testing uh, indicates it's a very healthy uh, form of behavior in alliances. You test the boundaries of your relationship to understand what are acceptable and what are unacceptable in your uh, relations with your counterpart allies. And boundary challenging uh, indicates that the allies uh, do not necessarily see eye to eye on every single issue, but they are willing to still work from within the alliance. And boundary breaking um, uh, as a process of intra-alliance opposition uh, indicates that uh, the allies do not see eye to eye with each other and increasingly indicate their willingness to work from the outside from without the alliance. So that really involves a number of countervailing alliances, as well as the use of more harder types of power, um, such as sanctions, such as uh, counterbalancing, uh, count, uh, uh, counter alliances, uh, the use of um, uh, compelling threats and so on and so forth. So um, in, the, uh, in the book, uh, if you, uh, uh, look at, at the uh, graph that I came up with on page 31, you will see that, I'm so sorry, you cannot see it, you will have to buy the book, I guess. <laughs> um, so uh, you can see the intersection between these different processes. So they are not mutually exclusive. And um, at the same time, um, uh, uh, this process is not a deterministic process, meaning that it doesn't necessarily go from boundary testing to boundary challenging to boundary breaking. So at any time uh, during the relationship, uh, the parties may revert back to um, other forms of uh, intra-alliance opposition, meaning boundary testing, boundary break, uh, challenging and boundary breaking. So, um, I, uh, in order to test this, uh, I basically looked at the uh, post-Arab Spring uh, developments in foreign policy of Turkey uh, up until mid-2019, the local elections in Turkey. Uh, so from 2010 to 2019, I have um, analyzed six different case studies in the book, uh, meaning uh, Turkey's foreign policy in the Western Balkans, uh, Turkey's uh, a veto uh, of uh, NATO EU security exchange, um, uh, Turkish uh, EU refugee deal, uh, Turkey's energy security uh, policies, uh, Turkey's uh, rapprochement with Russia uh, in defense issues, and uh, Turkish foreign policy in Syria and Iraq. Uh, so throughout these different case studies, uh, I have determined that um, uh, Turkey has uh, increasingly engaged in um, boundary uh, breaking type of a uh, behavior. So if you look at here, uh, I have here on page uh, 149, you will see the uh, trend here in terms of the progression of Turkish foreign policy behavior from boundary testing to ultimately and gradually to boundary breaking. And uh, this is through these different case studies that were examined um, in, in this book. Um, so uh, what, what does it leave us with? Um, in the book, uh, I have basically come up with um, three different uh, factors uh, to explain why we have seen this gradual change in Turkish foreign policy making vis-a-vis -vis the West. 
And there, uh, my goal uh, was to show that there are three different factors, main factors that are influential in determining why Turkey has been increasingly engaging in boundary breaking type of a behavior with the alliance. So the first reason is actually the changing international systemic variables. Uh, so we know that uh, you know, the uh, international system is changing uh, with unipolarity of the United States increasingly being challenged by the rising actors. And Turkey uh, within that international context actually sees a window of opportunity of offering a greater, more ambitious, more activist type of a foreign policy behavior. So in other words, Turkey wants to really see itself uh, being more and more recognized as a greater power. So at least in the region, in its immediate neighborhood, if not a world power. So uh, that is one motivation that seems to really motivate the Turkish political elites when it comes to their dealings with the West. And secondly, uh, on, as a corollary to that, uh, there are certain regional subsystemic factors that are influential in determining why Turkey is increasingly pursuing a boundary breaking type of a behavior. And that I actually uh, show that uh, Turkish authorities uh, agree that their interests are not taken seriously, uh, that are not considered uh, seriously by their Western counterparts. And uh, for instance, in Syria, as I indicate in the book, um, the, the Turkish authorities have been very critical of the fact that uh, the United States and certain European allies have been supportive of YPG um, in uh, the uh, Kurdish uh, component in the uh, northern Syria uh, in the fight against the Islamic State. Uh, so what we see there is actually um, YPG is considered as organically tied uh, to the terrorist organization that is uh, recognized by the United States and the European Union officially as a terrorist organization, PKK, which caused about 40,000 lives uh, um, uh, in Turkey, actually, that, uh, that uh, counterterrorism uh, and uh, that terrorism caused uh, uh, by PKK caused 40,000 lives. It is really significant, so uh, certainly not negligible. And uh, the Turkish authorities argue that you know there is this uh, you know one-on-one -on -one, uh, you know correspondence between PKK on one hand and YPG People's Protection Units in Syria on the other hand. They use the same uh, books. They use the same. Uh, they have the same um, uh, insignia, and they also have the same leader. Uh, that is governing the two organizations. So that is one of the reasons uh, at the subsystemic level, at the regional level. Another reason for that is um, uh, the um, sensitivities, Turkish sensitivities with regards to Cyprus. So uh, Turkey, as you all know, does not recognize the Republic of Cyprus and uh, Turkey still to this day maintains a, a sizable a uh, number of troops uh, on the island, in the northern part of island, uh, part of the island. And what we see here is that uh, Turkish authorities are saying that, okay, uh, we do not see eye to eye with uh, our allies on that. And on top of it, um, uh, in the book, I argue that uh, on top of the uh, systemic and regional subsystemic levels, the third factor that really factors in to explain this type of this current status of the Turkey West relations is domestic factors. So um, I argue that uh, because of the rising nationalism, especially since the failed coup attempt and the uh, subsequent formation of a coalition uh, between the Justice and Development Party on one hand and the Nationalist People's Party on the other hand, we have seen this really uh, shift into uh, this nationalist rhetoric in a very, very strong way. 
um, for instance, to illustrate, um, it is widely believed in the Turkish public opinion that the United States was behind the failed coup attempt in July 2016. Uh, so that really garners a lot of anti-Americanist sentiments. And just let me tell you uh, that it is not only specific to a certain uh, segment of the society, it is very widely held as an opinion. So that is an important element in explaining the status of the relations. And uh, at the same time, uh, I don't know if you know that, but the um, uh, perpetrator uh, of the uh, coup attempt, uh, uh, Fethullah Gülen, resides in Pennsylvania. So the alleged perpetrator of that uh, coup attempt. So uh, Turkish authorities have been really requesting the expulsion uh, of, uh, of uh, Gülen uh, from the United States to Turkey. Uh, but the US authorities uh, are saying that, okay, there are no direct uh, relevant, uh, direct evidence that links Gülen to himself, uh, to that particular failed coup attempt. So we, there, our hands are tied. Uh, so basically, that also creates another significant divide uh, between Turkey and the West. So Turkish uh, population starts to see the West as an existential threat to Turkey because here they were trying to really meddle in our domestic affairs. And here they are uh, trying to change the system uh, and so on and so forth. So that is the um, you know, very prevalent rhetoric in, among the Turkish public opinion. So there is the rising nationalism. And uh, at the same time, we are seeing uh, the lack of trust. And so all of these factors together basically create the impression that Turkey uh, is aggrieved. Uh, Turkey feels like its uh, sensitivities are not considered by the Western partners. And uh, in fact, the Western partners are supporting, uh, supporting policies that are detrimental to the survival of the Turkish state, um, as uh, considered with the YPG PKK link. So um, there is that. Um, and I also in the book uh, mention about Turkey's unwillingness to uh, in the very beginning of the uh, situation, unwillingness to uh, engage in the and uh, take part in the anti-IS coalition. Uh, so uh, that also created another major crisis of trust uh, between the United States and Turkey. And answer into this equation is the Turkish need uh, to have uh, airspace defense and a uh, desperate, dire need of having a defense system acquisition. And uh, Turkish authorities at first uh, did an open bid and uh, China was determined to be the supplier uh, in the beginning. And uh, then NATO allies really put a lot of pressure on Turkey saying that, oh no, this is not a NATO ally. We cannot really let the Chinese infiltrate. So you have to buy it from somewhere else. And Turks at the very last minute basically decided to not to buy it from China. And then uh, what happened was Russia uh, in the second bid years later, a uh, Russian bid was selected uh, because of the... Uh, uh, argument that the Russians really provided co-production um, opportunities for the Turkish defense industry. All right, so that was the uh, justification of the choice of uh, Russia uh, as a potential supplier of the S-400 uh, missile defense system. Uh, so the agreement was made in 2017 and in 2019 it was operationalized and uh, Turkey has been actually first suspended from the F-35 Joint Strike uh, Consortium, uh, which is a very important consortium. Turkey was a founding member, by the way. Uh, and Turkey was going to take part in the production of this, uh, you know, Joint Striker Fighter uh, uh, F-35, uh, fifth generation uh, and uh, jets. And uh, we have seen uh, with this uh, acquisition of S-400s from Russia, 
uh, that deal was um, uh, no longer the case. Turkey was first suspended from the consortium and um, uh, later on has been removed because of the operationalization of the system. Uh, so the argument on the side of the NATO allies is that it really creates an opportunity for the Russians to infiltrate into the NATO systems. And uh, it also uh, really um, is a system that is directly directed at the F-35. So uh, they will have multiple opportunities to observe the uh, features of F-35 if Turkey were to be given the F-35. So that was the logic on the part of the NATO. So this is where we were left um, at the time of November 2019 when the book was published. So um, at the end of the book, uh, I argue that there are three potential scenarios in terms of projecting for the future of Turkey-West relations. And what are those? Maintenance of the status quo, and the improvement in the status quo uh, in the relations, or further deterioration of the relations between Turkey and the West. And I argued in the book uh, in the mid middle of 2019, when I sent it to Cambridge University Press, I argued that uh, the relationship has not really seen its lowest point yet. Worse is yet to come, was the argument that I made. And I'm very, very sad personally, because I'm a staunch uh, transatlanticist, um, uh, to see that uh, my projections have come true, that uh, Turkish Western relations unfortunately have gone through further deterioration. Um, so um, let me put an end to my remarks, but I would love to elaborate in the Q&A section uh, as to why I think that uh, the relationship has further deteriorated. Thank you so much. <laughs> May I remain here? Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So uh, for me, it's better to remain here. Um, and um, I will reflect on a uh, Turkish uh, role in the Balkans, uh, putting it uh, in the context of uh, Turkish relations with uh, NATO and uh, European Union. But I will also speak about why Balkans matters for Turkey. So I think that uh, the West often misunderstands uh, Turkish interest in the Balkans and underestimates its strength, its power to project um, air to project their, uh, its power in this part of the world. Turkey uh, has, um, uh, I would say, has acted uh, in the recent past um, based on two, let's say, uh, presumptions. One of them is that Turkey acts and approaches the Balkans from the po from the position of a power. So. Uh, Turkey has been in the Balkans, knows the region very well, it's history behind it. History can be bumpy, uh, it depends on how countries see and read that history, but most countries are now ready, or political elites currently in the Balkans are ready to put history behind and to work with Turkey, to work with Turkey with open arms. So, therefore, uh, you know, Turkey try, uh, is trying to project itself as a power, not just regional power, and given its uh, um, uh, Culture, historical culture, culture of uh, uh, you know security culture in this part of the world, uh, and actually security culture and position that Turkey has um, been trying to revive not just in this part of the world but in the Middle East too. Uh, we can see this as a like a, a continuation or um, uh, you know of the same type of policy that Turkey has been doing in other parts of the world. Uh, on the other side, you know, uh, Turkey sees geopolitical uh, uh, momentum uh, actually opening for its uh, uh, involvement in the part of the world uh, since the West is in retreat for some time now, or its presence is waning. So Turkey sees itself as, an, uh, as, a, as a country that can uh, fill in that void, it can fill the vacuum along with other countries, so-called third third sides or other countries. So uh, I will quote um, a Turkish uh, uh, diplomat uh, who uh, maybe uh, rightly describe how Turkey sees its role in this part of the world. And also I will highlight two points in this small, uh, in this small quote. Turkey wants to be taken seriously in the Balkans, which is the first thing that I would like to highlight. Then it wants to be the primary actor in its own region, its own region. 
which means it sees this region as part of its own, how to say, regional policy that used to be part of its empire for centuries. And finally, but not to be a hegemon to run it, which means I think that understands well that in competing with other big powers, Russia, China, or European Union, or the US in this part of the world, uh, uh, Turkey cannot uh, uh, regain the power or gain the ground to be a hegemon. So um, in many uh, aspects, Turkish approach towards the region resembles uh, Russian, but not in each and every, how to say, segment of, um, uh, of its strategy. First of all, uh, as I said, Turkey, has uh, a long history of uh, relations with this, the region, as Russia does. Uh, it plays on its soft power, which means soft power, uh, cultural closeness, historical ties, uh, and religion. Uh, just to remind you that, uh, um, you know, for example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, 50% uh, of uh, citizens are Muslims, 80% uh, of citizens in Albania declare as Muslims. 18% in my country, Montenegro, declare uh, as, uh, as Muslims, which means those are uh, European Muslims who live uh, in the Balkans. Uh, they are rooted in that part of the world. They didn't come from other parts of the world. They have nothing to do uh, with the, uh, the Middle East. And to some extent, uh, you know, in terms of their ethnicity and background, has, they have nothing to do with Turkey. But in terms of their cultural closeness, uh, they see Turkey close to them, and uh, they see historical interplay between part of, of, of the of Balkans and Turkey as something positive. Uh, basis, springboard uh, for the future relations. So definitely, it uh, plays. Uh, uh, Turkey is, is paying more and more on that on that card. Uh, Tika Turkish uh, uh, Development Agency, that is the leading, uh, how to say is a visible face of Turkish presence in the region by investing in different sectors, in different fields, including like a renovation of mosques, um, opening libraries, to investing in, uh, in uh, economic development projects, programs. 18%, 18% of the total budget of TICA uh, goes to the Balkans, relatively small region, comparing to the world, but also speaks about how within that budget, uh, this region uh, is seen as an important segment of Turkish foreign policy. But that uh, I would want to make clear where Turkey and uh, Russia, how to say, uh, their strategies uh, are different. Turkey, uh, at least here in the Balkans, uh, doesn't test or doesn't push or doesn't challenge NATO and the European Union, at least in this, uh, in this corner of, of Europe. Actually, Turkey, sees opportunity uh, to advance its uh, interests and to advance its uh, you know uh, uh, to advance its uh, policies uh, by using NATO and the European Union. Uh, why? How? At least with two um, two um, elements. First, it supports European uh, uh, Euro Atlantic um, agenda of uh, countries from the region, particularly Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, is a uh, strong supporter of Bosnia and Herzegovina inclusion in NATO. Secondly, you know, uh, Turkey uh, uh, uses a uh, NATO European Union presence in the in the region to justify to have, to have the legitimate uh, uh, framework for their troops presence in the region. So it's a uh, one of the biggest troop contributor in came for. Uh, which is like, uh, a NATO run operation in Kosovo, uh, along with US. Italy and Austria, if, if I remember well, uh, it, uh, it has more than 300 troops uh, in Kosovo in Kfo. It's one of the biggest contributors in EU for European Union um, mission in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Therefore, it uses this um, to legitimize, actually, to legalize its presence, hard presence in the region. Uh, therefore, and also to work with uh, with. Uh, 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 with uh, uh, allies, in this case, NATO particularly. Uh, two countries are of particular interest for Turkish uh, uh, for foreign policy or for uh, Turkish interests uh, in, the, in the region. And it is, in my view, where uh, a big challenge for Turkey uh, lies. One of them is Serbia. Another of them 
is Bosnia and Herzegovina for different reasons. For Serbia, it's economic reason. Serbia is the biggest country in the Balkans, in this part of the Balkans, and uh, you know, the biggest trade partner of, of, of 2017, as far as I remember, 1 billion uh, euros was the trade value between Serbia and Turkey. On the other side, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina with its uh, ethnic makeup, which means made up of 50% uh, of Muslims uh, and 50% of uh, Serbs and Croats, is uh, seen for Turkey as a strategic country in the Balkans, not just because of historical reasons, but Turkey tries to posture uh, itself as a patron of uh, uh, Muslims living in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Muslims living uh, in the region, but particularly in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Siding by Muslims in Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, actually uh, confronts Turkey uh, uh, with Serbia, which means uh, it should balance all the time that uh, uh, the challenge to be good with Serbia at the same time because of economic. Uh, interest and to support uh, uh, Bosnia and Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, in order to fulfill uh, the role that Turkey wants to play in this part of the world. I would here uh, highlight the role uh, and personal diplomacy of the Turkish president. Uh, Turkish president uh, has actually uh, has visited region or the regional leaders have visited Turkey many many times in the last 15, uh, like say 10, 10 years. I think recently he visited, he had a meeting with the Serbian President Vucic. So, interesting enough, he has established good relations with Albanian, Serbian, Bosnian, Macedonian uh, uh, leaders in the region. Uh, I think that, you know, that his policy, his, his policy, the way how he uh, conducts um, foreign policy is based on pragmatism and economic interests. In many cases, his visits visits of him and people around him, which means including number of uh, uh, the, uh, prominent uh, Turkish entrepreneurs and uh, businessmen, actually opens door for Turkish uh, investments in that country that happened, for example, in Montenegro or in Serbia. Also, I would say one more thing plays a role. Uh, Erdogan wants to, President Erdogan wants to play a role of a strong man uh, in the region and wants to be seen as a strong man wants to be seen as strong man. Uh, and also this type of like a relationship between, let's say, um, uh, hybrid regimes, they love one another. So he, uh, when, when he plays visit in Serbia or in Bosnia, you know, I think the way how business is done, business culture, uh, development models are very much familiar to one another. Therefore, you know, when they discuss this, they can actually discuss it on equal footing in a way how they understand uh, uh, the, um, how these, uh, the projects will be developed in countries, which is, can be, um, uh, which can be from some, certain perspective helpful for Turkish uh, further influence in the region. Uh, but that said, uh, uh, President Erdogan uh, has competitors in, uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, President Putin, who is, uh, uh, you know, loved by Orthodox population uh, in the Balkans, uh, and also plays the role of a strong man. Uh, and another who is now a relatively new leader, but is gaining ground more and more, is Chinese president, uh, who uses Serbia as a springboard to expand Chinese interest in the Balkans. So putting Turkey then in that context, geopolitical context, it has rivals. And rivals in this case comes from outside of NATO, and comes from outside of the European Union. Therefore, in that context of, of, of the Balkans, Turkey is trying to, how should I say, be supportive to NATO or Euro-Atlantic agenda of countries concerned. Just, I will end with, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a case which illustrates uh, Turkish soft power in the Balkans. It's a, I don't know whether you know, it's a case of uh, Orhan Pamuk story when, um, uh, City Council of Sarajevo capital of Bosnia and Herzegovina several years ago decided to uh, honor very fa famous, renowned author, Nobel Prize winner from Turkey, Orhan Pamuk, at the same time, an opponent to President Erdogan. They wanted to honor him uh, a title of honorary citizen of Sarajevo. They voted unanimously. 
for this title to be given to uh, Orhan Pam. Then Turkey intervened and they voted again in seven days. And you can imagine what the result of the vote was. They revoked the first decision. So it speaks that Turkey has soft power and uh, in some cases can use it effectively against countries in the region. Um, I can go on, but I will, you know, uh, I'm at your disposal for questions. Definitely, since you mentioned Gulen and Gulenis and Gulenis centers in the Balkans, it's a very interesting story, but we can speak about, about that later on. The only country that stood up against Turkey in this case was Kosovo, interestingly. Thank you. I'm going to stand up because I want to see who's falling asleep. <laughs> Much easier to uh, follow and um, ask you questions. So, my colleagues have already covered the most important points on Turkey and the transatlantic uh, relations. So, um, I'll follow the rule that if you can't be enlightening, at least be provocative. So, um, here goes. I think I want to start by giving kind of a a global context to what we've been discussing and then a regional context and talk a little bit about, I think, what's going to happen in the next year or so and what we maybe can do about it, what the Transatlantic Alliance can do to stop some of the problems that I think will crop up. So actually, before the global context, I want to start with the cosmic contents, context. And that is, if a um, superior intelligent being someday, 100 years, 1,000 years from now, comes down to visit the rubble, of, of earth and um, is asking questions about what he or she finds. One of the questions I think will be, how did 7.5 billion humans elect or appoint or accept such terrible leaders? How did humans decide that people like Putin or Donald Trump or Erdogan or Z should be their leaders? It's a mystery. It's a mystery to me now but you can imagine a thousand years from now so i think um some of the things we can put in the time capsule to help these intelligent beings understand um coming back to to earth um there are certain trends that encompass what um professor oya and uh, professor vesco have been talking about turkey and the transatlantic alliance and one and this is not going to be very enlightening again is the clash between authoritarianism or autocracy and democracy. And this is one of the trends that's been sweeping and influencing not only Europe, the whole world from the United States, throughout Europe, um, throughout Asia, everywhere. This tension between authoritarianism and you call liberal democracy, which I think is one of the reasons why we've come up with such horrible leaders, but also why we have such instability and conflict and problems, including the Western Balkans, including the Eastern Mediterranean. Well, why does this happen? How do we end up with um, what seems to be, to me, a um, preeminence, uh, at least a temporary victory of authoritarianism over what we consider to be democracy, liberal democracy? And I'd say they're, they're, they're in addition to this, this authoritarian authoritarianism versus democracy concomitantly so uh, arises as, as Professor Oya mentioned of nationalism, populist nationalism. Uh, I would say there's also a trend against multi-ethnicity or multiculturalism. And all of this I think is, is related to a certain extent. Now, this is not new. Uh, this is certainly not uh, revelatory, but one question is when does this start? And that's a whole other, another topic perhaps, but I think you can look back over the last 10 years and find examples where certain things happened, bad things happened, and there was not a reaction. There was not a reaction from those that traditionally uphold or defend democracy. You can go back to, to use the Turkish example, 2013. Um, I think when there was a, maybe not the beginning, but a beginning of repression or crackdown on dissent in Turkey in Gezi Square, Gezi Park. Uh, that's one example. I think in 2014, in my diplomatic lifetime, probably the crucial example of a blow against uh, democracy uh, and 
what you could call the rules-based order. I know that's a, it's, it's a freighted term, but I would say against the international rules-based order was Russia's invasion of Ukraine and annexation of Crimea. Uh, there's an example, another example, I think, in, in Europe of Hungary in 2018. And I think as a educational institution, you all will remember that Central, Univers Central European University was shut down by Hungary, a member of the EU and of NATO. And nothing was done. Nothing was done. Uh, I, I'm not comparing a crackdown in Jesse Park to uh, closure of university or of, um, for example, um, uh, the assassination by Saudi Arabia, state assassination of a Washington Post journalist um, in 2018. But all these, I think, are examples of how authoritarian governments have been able to get away with ignoring or abusing rules, abusing democracy, um, with, uh, with no consequence. Now, the next question I'd ask, we don't know exactly when, it's been fairly recent, I would say within the last 10 years, but, but why? And one of the reasons I think this has happened is, of course, the breakdown of this so-called rules-based order. And some of you may argue there never was a rules-based order, it was imaginary. Uh, but something, whether you call it a rules-based order, the liberal order, there was something that prevented countries, whether it was China or Russia or Turkey, from going as far as they have against norms, the rules, the laws that have helped kept the peace in Europe and uh, the rest of the world for the last 70 years. I think also there's a willingness of citizens, and I think this includes Turkey, China, uh, United States, a willingness of citizens to accept authoritarianism, accept a new form of democracy, if you will, that maybe not so long ago, we would have rejected or would have been more problematic. Uh, there's a combination of reasons for that. I think also there's, there's uh, people are willing to sacrifice um, democracy in some cases, liberty for uh, security, predictability. And this, this, this I think has been seen in, in countries um, around the world and particularly problematically, I would say in Europe, which is Europe and uh, the transatlantic community, the wider transatlantic community, where people traditionally uh, covet, um, treasure, cherish uh, civil liberties and, uh, and human rights. A third reason for, uh, for this trend towards authoritarianism, I think, is, um, is state capture, this phenomenon which is not new, uh, but I think has been perfected to an art by a number of leaders around the world, in, including Erdogan, Putin, um, any leader uh, you could name in, um, in the Western Balkans. Milo Djukanovic, I think, was a, was a master. Um, perhaps he still is. But all throughout, I think, the Western Balkans, um, the wider Balkans, there is this um, phenomenon, unfortunate phenomenon of state capture, in which either an individual or a party has been able to take hold of the institutions, the laws, and use them to their own advantage to stay in power. Another reason why this has happened is that there are very skilled players at this game, at the authoritarianism, authoritarianism game, if you can call it that. Putin, extremely skillful. Um, Erdogan, I would say, very skillful as a politician and someone able to use the tools that I've mentioned. On the other side of that has been, I think, very unskillful reaction or a lack of reaction from those, again, who traditionally defend uh, democratic values, uh, civil liberties, human rights um, around the world, including, I would say, the United States and the European Union. So there is, there is this phenomenon, which is global, uh, that uh, includes, I think, Turkey and the Western Balkans. And I think it's important to remember that what we're talking about is not just isolated to one region, one country, but it's actually growing uh, around the world. And it's a, it's a cause of not only, I think it's not only a topic for intellectual scholarly Study, but one that all of us should be worried about as it impacts um, our lives and uh, those of our allies and friends uh, around the world. In a regional context that I just wanted to touch on very briefly, um, I'd say that the good news for the region, uh, Eastern Mediterranean, the Western Balkans, I suppose not the entire region, it's very hard to generalize because it's a very diverse set of countries, but overall things are not that bad. Um, things are, things, they're, they're, there's not um, widespread war, or conflict. Uh, there's tension though, there's instability, there's economic stagnation. Uh, there's still um, a great deal 
of deficit in respect for human rights and civil liberties, which is a cause for instability and can should be of concern to the, the, the wider Western world, including the US and, and EU. But the problems are, while well, they're serious, but they're not necessarily uh, insurmountable. And I think it's possible for the West, for the EU and the US to address and possibly even solve um, some, of these, uh, some of these problems. I do wanna mention in the, um, the context of, of Turkey and of Russia, as Professor Vesco mentioned, uh, and also Professor Oya, there is this very, um, one could call it unholy alliance or unusual partnership between Turkey and Russia, which I would describe as sort of like maybe a summer, um, a summer school romance, which is very intense, but not particularly deep or broad. It's a relationship of convenience, one in which both sides are able to benefit from. Uh, Russia, with its energy, its natural gas, uh, as well as Turkey, benefiting from the transaction of large volumes of um, Russian gas to help Turkey, its industry, its economy, obviously. Also, uh, its arms, as, as Professor Oya mentioned, uh, Turkey able to purchase um, S-400 air defense um, system from Russia. Um, Russia able to trade and invest with, with Turkey. But also, uh, Turkey and Russia are competitors, uh, whether it uh, is in Syria or in Libya uh, or in NATO. There are many cases in which there is this tension. So I don't think um, the Turkish-Russian relationship is one that will cause problems for a long term, uh, but is nevertheless uh, should be a source of concern to the EU and the US and something that we need to address. So, What's coming ahead? Um, I would say, looking ahead to next year, probably we'll see more of the same. Um, we'll probably see authoritarianism make further gains. Uh, I assume that is true because it is already on the rise. There is very little on the horizon to stop uh, the authoritarians of the world. And in fact, they're gaining, I think, the tools, particularly as you will all know better than I, in technology, the use of spyware, ransomware, um, the ability to um, keep track of and repress opposition opponents of um, the authoritarian governments, whether it's in Turkey or Russia or elsewhere, including the United States. So I think there are new tools that the uh, anti-democratic forces can use to increase their influence um, around the world. So this comes to the question, most important question, what can we do about it? And I'd say there's probably a lot that we can do. And what we can do and what we will do is obviously quite different, but I wanna make a few suggestions. Um, first of all, I think that both Europe, the European Union in particular, NATO, United States need to assert their leadership um, much more boldly than they have before. Um, one of the lessons I think we've seen from the authoritarians, we can learn from the authoritarians, is that who dares wins. And the authoritarians have been very bold. And I think you know, on, the, on the theme of boundary um, pushing and breaking, we've seen the authoritarians, not just in Turkey, but around the world, test the boundaries, surpass the boundaries and continue because there has not been resistance or sufficient resistance to make them change course. So the first thing that I think the United States and uh, NATO and the EU need to do is to assert leadership, um, assert accountability, hold responsible the leaders of these states and the states themselves for what they're doing. Much easier said than done, I understand that. Um, since I only have 10 minutes, I will uh, uh, happy to answer questions of what sort of things I think are possible to do. Uh, it's incredibly difficult, but the one I will say um, from the podium is the, uh, the use of leverage. And this is something that Turkey, Russia, China, um, other authoritarian states have been able to resist is what the West has been up to this point willing to deploy as leverage to bend these countries, these authoritarian states to their will. Um, sanctions, for example, not very effective. Um, I'm a big fan, actually, as a diplomat. I think um, sanctions, economic pressure is much preferred over the use of military force um, and is um, an important complement to normal diplomacy. So, I think that the West, one thing the West has, has failed at, and this might be another thing the 
the intelligent uh, being from a thousand years from now will ask, why didn't the European Union and the United States and NATO, NATO being the most powerful military alliance in history, EU and the US controlling most of the finances of the world, uh, controlling the World Wide Web, um, control information. Why were these countries, these organizations, unable or unwilling to use these tools to stop a country like Russia from invading another sovereign country, which is friendly towards the EU and the US, or to stop China from establishing islands, facts on the ground in the, in the sea, in the South China Sea, stopping um, Turkey from repressing dissent or uh, unauthorized exploration and drilling in the Eastern Mediterranean. There is certainly a lot of, um, there are a lot of good reasons why you cannot use some of the financial tools or the military tools. There are limits to what uh, we can do without creating even greater problems. But I would argue that we have not done enough. We've not been imagined enough. We've not been created enough in using what we have influence we have short of military force in order to turn the tide of authoritarianism um, towards democracy. So at one time, Turkey was considered the sick man of Europe, um, early 20th century. Now it's a strong man, as, as uh, Professor Vesper has, has mentioned in Europe, a strong man, a strong man at least. The sick man may well be, sorry, this is probably gender uh, insensitive, but, um, the U.S., which considers, it a, considers itself a, a European power, but has been largely absent for many of the, the disputes, many of the, the conflicts, which, of course, are European, and the Europeans should be able to should be able to defend themselves, take care of their own security, but do need help in in many instances. So, I think it's very much up to the United States to lead and lead from the front. Uh, I don't believe there's any kind of possibility of leading from behind, as, as, as some have said in the past. It's important to set an example. We have been, the United States has had many failings over the past, not just four or five years, but over the last decade, I think, um, in helping areas such as the Western Balkans. Um, it's a fact that Turkey is an important ally. It should be an even better ally. I think it's a fact that Western Balkans need to be integrated into the rest of Europe if not um, as members of the EU, and Professor Vesco and I have talked about this, it, it does appear that the European project, um, a European enlargement process is, is dead, or if it's not dead, it's in a deep coma. If that's the case, and it's certainly Europe's prerogative to decide whether or not to march, but if that is the case, then it's incumbent upon the EU, and to a lesser extent the United States, to find some other framework, some other vision for the countries of the Western Balkans, and it includes uh, Turkey, their place to find, help them find their place in uh, Europe and the wider transatlantic community. Because if not, you have the problems that we're seeing now. So just finally to close, I'd say there, there are ways that the United States and Europe can and must counter, whether it's in Turkey or it's in Russia or China, Belarus, authoritarianism and the repression of civil liberties, um, and democracy. It takes a more daring approach, a bolder approach, and the willingness, creativity to use tools that we have, but we have not been willing to use up till now. I think it's also very clear that if the EU is able to do this, if the United States is able to help countries, whether it's Montenegro or Serbia or Turkey, integrate further with the uh, European Union, with NATO also. It will not only help the region, but help the United States and Europe become more stable and prosperous as well. So thank you very much. Lots to think about. <laughs> And um, at this time, I'd like to thank everyone, uh, Dr. Oskancha, Ambassador Garcevich, and Mr. Yi. And um, I'd like to open it to our audience for a Q&A portion. So if anyone has any questions. Yep. Um, I have a question for all of you. Um, do you still believe Turkey is a democratic um, government, considering some of the actions taken by uh, President Erdogan?
no? And anyone can do, would you like to go first? Uh, well, I'll start. Um, okay. I think Turkey would be classified as a hybrid state, uh, somewhere between a democracy and a consolidated democracy and a full on authoritarian <laughs> state. Um, there are some both. It uh, has traditionally been at least an electoral democracy, um, but there has been a uh, uh, repression of civil, liberty, civil, liberty, civil liberties and of rights, human rights that are traditionally associated with democracy. So it's somewhere in between. As I would say, um, it's not black or white for any country. There are elements, I think, of uh, authoritarianism, of um, illiberalism in the United States um, and a lot of other countries. I forget the name of the organizations. It's the World Justice Project. It does the, the Freedom Chart and the Democracy Chart. Turkey is not one of the countries, but I'm pretty sure House, Freedom House. Freedom House. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it would be one of the countries ranked as an uh, as, a, as a hybrid country. Yeah, but if I may add, I would say along the same line. So uh, since I come from the region where we can speak about hybrid regimes in most cases, if not in all cases. So um, I can say also that how I see Turkey is a, it's a hybrid regime, but what's more is me, uh, it's not just uh, how we portray a regime or a system, but also what the trend is. I see trend downwards, which means I see a democratic backsliding. Um, I don't see trend going up, which means you can discuss a country which has certain problems, uh, uh, democratic uh, deficiency. But if you see the trends over time, which means in the last five, six, ten years, then you will, uh, uh, you can, how to say, acknowledge that progress is done and that at least in terms of trajectory, country is on good track. I would say that, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm not informed well, but uh, it looks like uh, uh, it, uh, it's like a going down. Uh, as as, as, as uh, Hoyt said, uh, it, there is no black and white, so it's, you cannot just put countries in one or another basket. Uh, but, uh, um, you know, there are organizations uh, that uh, carefully examine year after year trends in different areas, in different fields, and they come up with uh, uh, their reports, uh, which are very objective and many governments, including mine, my former government, uh, doesn't like them. But believe me, they have to, you know. And also, um, I would like to add to what was said by my fellow co-panelists that, you know, the resilience of democracy is something to be admired, I think. And uh, if there is something that the world context has taught us in the last couple of years is, Oh, it has uh, wonderfully pointed it out. You know, democracies are uh, really fragile. Uh, so it really takes a lot on the part of the civil society organizations and citizens as individuals to really maintain and protect them. Uh, otherwise, you know, uh, it is really easy to be lost. So uh, in that regard, I think that, you know, the checks and balances system, uh, um, you know, is so important in democracies and the way the system is structured is really very, very important. As we have all discovered, even in this country, unfortunately, uh, the checks and balances uh, can really become so um, uh, transient and uh, really can be very fragile. Uh, and uh, the founding fathers have not really necessarily um, uh, taken uh, the uh, mechanisms uh, to prevent, you know, someone with uh, ill intentions when they come to power, how they can abuse the system. So this is really uh, a weakness of all democratic systems, I think. And as Churchill has pointed out, you know, uh, democracy is the worst system um, uh, of all uh, uh, outside uh, for the uh, uh, democracy is the worst system except for when compared to the rest. Uh, so it is the best that we have. And uh, it really requires a lot of work and active uh, stance on the part of the citizens to protect it. So if I may add just a sentence as, a, as somebody who is not an American, but who is, you know, 
who has been living here for some years and have been living through what was going on in the, in the previous administration. But I can say comparing to systems I come from or systems that I know very well because I was inside there that I was living in there. There is something which is called separation of power and institutions. And, uh, and separation and power don't, uh, this principle, this concept doesn't allow somebody to capture state. Uh, you know, if you see that, you know, cap, that Congress may stand up against somebody, that you have like a, a, a justice system, which is the third branch of, of power that may stand up against somebody, which means that this balance of power and this interplay between different powers actually keep a check somebody who is executive in executive branch of power to capture all other branches and actually to put their hands over them and to control completely. It is what I see happening in countries with big institutions, like in my in my part of the world. Uh, when you have somebody in power over time, executive branch uh, is so powerful that keeps under control all other branches of power, including the parliament. So um, um, I've seen that we can draw powers and see who, call, who act in what way uh, in this world. So I, I have a question. Um, it seems like to me anyway, that democracy comes from struggle. It comes from chaos. Uh, you don't have a, a, a democracy without um, the people rising up and saying, this has to stop. And whether it be the French Revolution, whether the American Revolution, whether it be Arab Spring, it all starts from some sort of discourse where the people had to rise up and do something. So in some respects, if you believe that, then the enemy of democracy is complacency. And right now, if you look at the United States and a lot of evolving democracies or maybe devolving democracies, what we're struggling with is complacency. So we forgot in some respects how to lead. And in some respects, leadership is a muscular activity, uh, not being strong, but whether you're using leverage points or whether you're using um, soft power or even hard power, you have to be willing to engage because ultimately democracy is about engagement. It's about the will of the people and their elected officials being willing to engage. And if you're not willing to engage because you've allowed complacency to get woven into your society, you actually forget how to. So when you look at the emergence of strongmen, right, and autocracy, whether it, even in parts of the United States, right, as you see it popping up in different uh, pockets, it's because people have forgotten or unwilling to um, give up the comfort of today for that um, strife that kind of got us to democracy anyway. So if you're not willing to stand up and fight for what you believe in, then complacency just allows it to happen. And I guess my question would be, and I'd love to hear it from you, whether primarily in the United States, but certainly other places, how do you fight that complacency that just becomes um, the evolution of softness, right? You're will, unwilling to give up uh, the creature comforts that democracy gave us, or allowed us to happen, but now you've got to give it up if you're willing to fight for democracy. So how do you get a society? Uh, how do we get the United States, uh, much less what we might have to do, uh, you know, helping Europe? How do we get people here to stand up? How do we get people to uh, fight that sense of complacency, recognizing that to fight it, you've got to be willing to give up some of those creature comforts that democracy has allowed you to enjoy? So um, kind of a long question, but it's just kind of an observation. I think it's a great question. Sorry, but I'll go ahead. Just, um, I agree 99%, 99%. The 1% where I would say there is a, at least a caveat or an exception to the rule about complacency being the main problem is the case that uh, Professor Vesco is mentioning of state capture, state capture, in which states uh, in the Western Balkans, let's say, for example, people really can't freely express their will. In Bosnia Herzegovina, for example, uh, people are fearful of voting for the wrong wrong party outside of their ethnic group because it means they'll lose their jobs or their cousin or their uncle will lose his job or uh, there'll be some kind of punishment. So in the Balkan case, in cases in which state capture is the real impediment, uh, what the West needs to do, uh, I think the West is obliged to help in certain cases, certainly in the Western Balkans, is to help remove some of the obstacles. In other words, if a kleptocrat, if a, a corrupt official who has managed to grab 
with a stranglehold, all the reins of power, is preventing a free democratic process or a reasonably free and fair electoral process because he or she had, well, he, so we're talking about the Balkans, so he is able to either intimidate or jail or somehow repress uh, candidates who are in opposition, then the, the people, you could still make the arguments are not adequately motivated to rise up, for example, a revolution or an armed struggle. But it's not really complacency. In this case, I think it's more of a, um, a grudging acceptance that the alternative of a livelihood or life or voting against the, the dictator in power um, is, is really a pragmatic one. So I'd say in captured states, the imperative is to somehow uh, neutralize or rein in uh, the kleptocratic uh, dictator. In the United States, and I want to be you know, nonpartisan here, but I think in the United States, we don't have the same obstacle, but we do have a lot of misinformation. And this is also a problem um, in Europe. You know, Russia uh, meddled almost effectively in Montenegro's 2016 elections, um, almost effectively in Greece's uh, 2018 elections. Uh, if those kinds of obstacles are not dealt with, uh, then of course there is no free expression of democratic will. And that needs to be dealt with, I think, including the United States. People do not have accurate information sufficiently to make informed choices, to make informed democratic choices. So even along those lines, right, and I'll extend it, so complacentism can kind of lead to ignorance and the acceptance of kind of the social media interference, right? It's easier for me just to read it and accept it and say, I, okay, it must be true because I saw it on the internet, as opposed to, and that's, that's complacency in some, it's just a different level of complacency, as opposed to how do we as a society engage people to say, just don't believe everything you hear, everything you read, because at the end of the day, we're all, right, uh, empowered as being in a democracy to learn the truth. And if you can learn the truth, then you should be able to affect the truth, whether it's here or quite frankly, I'll say complacency is because even though the West knew what was happening or thought they knew what was happening, did it do enough to actually stand up for those people? So again, I'll, I'll go back to, I get it, but there is a complacency here because ultimately for democracies to receive, then democracies around the world have to be able to kind of affect it, which means sometimes I have to go out of my comfort zone and I do have to cross an ocean maybe two, uh, but I have to do something because just saying, what a shame, doesn't really work. Um. I wanna thank all the panelists for this very informative presentation. Um, my question goes towards Dr. Zenka. Um, you said towards the end of your presentation that when you submitted your book, you've seen a bigger deterioration of the relationship between the Western countries and Turkey. Uh, I would love to hear more of this argument but uh, I also like to hear the panelists of how how can the Western countries develop and strengthen the relationship with Turkey uh, nowadays? Beautiful question, and I'm so grateful that you asked. Um, so I think that uh, you know, ever since the book was published, at that point in time, uh, the uh, S400 system was not operationalized. So since then, it has operationalized. As President Erdogan calls it, it's a done deal, uh, despite the uh, you know warnings from the Western allies. Uh, we have also seen the freezing of the EU accession negotiations since then uh, of Turkey. So what I argue now uh, is that things have progressed in a very path-dependent way. And path dependency is basically if uh, some institutions of relationship erode uh, in bilateral relations, this will ensure that the future of the relationship will also uh, deteriorate. Um, so, and this is exactly what we are seeing right now. So, uh, what we have seen is that uh, because the uh, Turkish uh, party has been removed from the F-35 Joint Striker Consortium, uh, Turkey has now turned to Russia in order to procure uh, additional uh, stuff. Uh, I, I will explain it furthermore. Uh, so, for instance, um, right now it is on the agenda in the United States that Turkey has asked to uh, procure uh, some additional F-16s as well as some modernization kits. 
uh, in the place of the F-35s that it has paid for. And uh, it is really in the agenda of the US Congress right now. So my argument is that um, if you close one venue, it will lead to further deterioration in the relationship. If we deny Turkey the uh, acquisition of F-16s, uh, which is direly needed for security related reasons, it is going to further push Turkey into the sphere of uh, influence of Russia. And in fact, President Erdogan himself has declared that, okay, then we are going to procure SU-35s and so on and so forth. So uh, that's a, a very important um, uh, point that I would like to make, this path dependency. And the same is true for the EU, right? So EU has since then frozen the accession negotiation process which arguably was not going anywhere to begin with because of mainly technical and political reasons. Um, but uh, with the removal, at least on a temporary basis, of the accession negotiations institution, which is an important part of the bilateral relations between Turkey and the European Union, paradoxically, it has also kind of removed the leverage the EU has in terms of shaping the Turkish democracy and political system. So path dependency is really important here, and we should be very careful and cognizant of not further sliding down and deteriorating this relationship, because then we will definitely ensure that the worst is yet to come. So, yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Uh, if I can add a couple of words concerning whether how West can, like uh, how West, you know, European Union and NATO, as I said, uh, to be precise, see and work with Turkey. Uh, for NATO, I would say, uh, you know, NATO understands or NATO member states understand, putting aside what we discussed so far in the first round of questions, they understand why Turkey is important geostrategically uh, and that Turkey is needed. As Turkey needs NATO, NATO needs Turkey, be, be frank here. Uh, and uh, with the situation in the Middle East and uh, um, intelligence uh, comes from two countries, uh, the US and Turkey, when it comes to NATO. Uh, and when the Syrian crisis uh, uh, broke out in uh, um, uh, several years ago, then I remember I was at the time uh, serving, um, I was ambassador of my country in NATO, though we were not members and we were not allowed to participate fully in that. But since you are there, then you can have a chance to uh, listen, to talk to your colleagues and to get a bit of understanding what's going on uh, behind the, the doors. Then um, 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 understanding was that uh, Turkey uh, was uh, very helpful at that uh, moment and uh, playing uh, an important role for NATO. I will just remind you that uh, it was uh, Netherlands and uh, Germany who decided to install, uh, to actually uh, uh, give Turkey for, time, uh, for some time uh, their systems uh, to be installed on Turkey soil as a, as, a sign, as a sign of solidarity with Turkey. When it comes to European Union and membership to Turkey, Turkey to European Union, that is a more difficult question. And uh, for that, we need not just a panel, but I think several panels to answer. I will, but I will give you just what I think. And I will not give you an answer, I will give you a question. The question is, and it comes uh, back in history, whether Turkey is a European country or not. And if you see Europe in the 19th century, uh, for example, Vienna Congress, which created uh, Europe of the 19th century, then following other conferences, following that Congress. Turkey was not part of it, never invited, never invited to participate in it, never seen as an integral part of the European continent. Sometimes, from time to time, sporadically, European powers were siding by Turkey, like in Crimea war in the 19th century, not this one. Um, but not because of Turkey, it was because of Russia, to keep Russia check not to help out Turkey. Turkey at that time had only one ally, I would say. It was UK to some extent in the late 19th century. Uh, so then uh, when it comes to European, uh, European powers. So therefore, you know, um, this current government, uh, 
uh, again, to come back to our discussion, uh, gives good argument to Brussels not to invite and to keep uh, accession negotiation on hold because they can always use, uh, you know, democratic backsliding as a strong argument for not uh, going further with the accession negotiations. But uh, uh, before this government, there had been governments and the process didn't go fast. I'll give you a short answer. One word, energy. I think the uh, solution, one easy, not easy, one obvious solution to improving relations between Turkey and the West is partnering with Turkey to bring gas from the Caspian into Europe, not just Italy, but into, into wider Europe, so that we can wean Turkey and Europe off of Russian gas and bring gas from whether it's uh, Eastern Med or Caspian um, into Europe. That is a natural partnership and something, again, Putin has outsmarted the West, outbribed the West, to get Turkey to cooperate more with Russia. But it, that can be reversed. And it's another area where the US and Europe need to be more daring and willing to use re the resources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to our audience for their great questions and our speakers. And I will turn the floor to Dr. Von Thank you. Well, you know, I think we're left with more questions than before, which is a, a sign of a successful uh, panel discussion. Uh, and it really leads me to the, you know, in my question, the security versus democracy uh, question since uh, the mid 90s when I was working on my dissertation. And I was very happy to hear both of those sides and the balancing act here this evening. Uh, I want to thank everybody for being here. I would be remiss if I didn't say a thank you to Mr. Perdikakis for all the help that he has given me uh, the last uh, few years and the help that he has given us uh, at the Institute. And it's nice to see all these friends. There's plenty of cookies and coffee and tea in the back. And thank you all for being here with us. Thank you.